right, you ready? Yeah. There's a little delay on the on the screen. Yeah, I'm not going to look at this. Screen. So, um, um, hello, my name is William Burnett, and uh, we're here with Jordan Chomansky. Yes. On uh, the new latest episode of uh, Daytime Talk Video. Yeah. Hello, uh, welcome to New York. Thank you very much. You Bro- Brooklyn, New York. Greenpoint, Brooklyn, the the right at the top, top of Greenpoint. Yeah, and I was just telling you how much I uh, enjoy your neighborhood uh, in comparison to other Brooklyn neighborhoods I've frequented. <laughs> Why is that? I don't know. Less annoying. You don't see as many. I mean, there is a Starbucks across the street, and but McDonald's too. Yeah, that doesn't. McDonald's doesn't bother me. Star- Starbucks bothers me a bit. McDonald's doesn't. And I don't know. I don't see many annoying. Uh, kind of types walking around and uh i've never been in the mcdonald's no. I went, i've been i went i've been in the starbucks because w- w- for a little while i was homeless and okay. my studio was over there and, and i would go in there and use the internet sometimes in the morning yeah, they have good internet and then um i also went in one time at uh, lori lori sold me her uh electro harmonics uh the pitch factor uh who's, pedal. who's lori lori um antennas ah okay i bought i went in there to buy a pedal from her that was wha- she wanted. She didn't trust me to do it in private. She thought I was going to rob her. Ah, well, you know, she has a a reason to be suspicious. You yeah. think so? Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> oh, geez. All right. Well, so we're, so we're going to do a, a, a music related podcast here. Um, uh, the, the 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 we're supposed to talk about music. We can talk about whatever you want. But uh, the little introduction that I know is that uh, people, you know, you're you're uh, is Israeli. I'm, no, I'm v- first of all, first of all, you're a Canadian. No, no, American. Let, yes, I mean, I was born in the. St- I'm, I'm all three. I have three pass. I have three. Uh, what's it called? Uh, nationalities. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a multinational. How, how did, how did you manage that? Yeah, I never uh, heard the story. Okay, my mother, she's Canadian, therefore I'm automatically Canadian. That's a uh, fact of life. Uh, I was born in uh, Ohio, therefore I'm uh, an American <laughs> citizen. What city? Uh, Columbus, Ohio. And, and uh, how did that? There, like a, a my th- my dad had a job there. Doing what? Uh, teaching. So it was like a the college there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Yeah. So they, my parents lived there for like I don't know five years or and something. And your dad is an American. No, my dad was born in Palestine. Yeah, he was born like in, uh, yeah, I mean, Israel. I mean, he was born there before it was Israel, so it's like Palestinian, I guess. Like 47. Oh, geez. And then, uh, so you're born in in the 70s. I was born in 75, Columbus, Ohio. My parents decided in 83 that, uh, yeah, maybe we should try to move to that fucked up country in the Middle East. Because I think my father saw a few swastikas around Columbus and he said, ah, fuck this shit, I'm going <laughs> to. I mean, he, he left Israel. His parents left Israel when he was like 16. And he was living in like Philadelphia. And, uh, but eventually he met my mom. What's, what's your dad's first name? I'm just curious. Uh, Danny. Daniel. Da- Daniel. And, y- and your mother is? Uh, Sherry. Cher. Yeah. Sherry. Sharon. Sharon. Yeah, I call so her Cher. So can we refer to them as that? For the rest of the story, mm, no. Share, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, my dad. Uh, yeah, I don't call him Danny. Hey, Danny, what's up? Yeah, but Danny, you can call him Danny. What do you, you What want. do you call him when you talk to him? Papa, pop, mm, yeah, Popsy, Popsy. No, just kidding. I call him uh, Abba. I speak. Abba. I, sp- I speak exclusively Hebrew to my father. Okay. Exclusively English to my mother. Okay. Because my mother doesn't speak much uh, Hebrew. And my father, I don't know, because we have a weird relationship. Is your, is your mother also a Jew? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you're, but, you know, atheist type kind of oh Jew. I know, but I'm just, you know. Yeah, yeah. Getting she's, down to she's the, Jewish. Since, yeah. since we're starting at the beginning, you know. Yeah, she's a weird, you know, this, this is interesting because she's a weird kind of Canadian Jew, which is extremely different than American Jews I've encountered. I, mean, I don't know many American Jews, like USA uh, based Jews. Yeah, adjust it. But yeah, she comes from Nova Scotia. I don't know if you wa- did. You ever see the show uh, Trailer Park Boys? <laughs> I've seen the commercial. Yeah, so I mean, basically, uh, my mom's family kind of sounds like that. They're from the same area, like Nova Scotia. They come from a family of. Uh, 
Yeah, it's a weird thing. They're like junk collector Jews. I mean, they moved. They they, they ran away from uh, like Latvia or something from in, in the 1860s, and they became and like scrappers or something. scrappers exactly like a junkyard, and so they're kind of like uh, working class Canadian Jews that sound like the dudes from Trailer Park Boys. Yeah, so that's interesting. I mean, I never you know yeah, that's a different kind of Jew than I'm used to. <laughs> Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, and so you're born there. Do you, you have brothers and sisters? I have an uh, older sister who lives in Israel now. And she was also born in Columbus? No, she was born in Ithaca, uh, in Syracuse, New Syracuse, York. Syracuse, New York. Because my... Another teaching job, probably. No, that wasn't when he was a student. Oh, okay. So so they, had, they were in their 20s when they had you. Early 20s. Early yeah. 20s, so like yeah. a normal for that time. Yeah, of and course. Then, uh, and then... Uh, then you skip the army. No, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, well, I don't know what. I, so what? Ha, what? I don't know. Yeah, so I was I was in Israel basically since I was like nine ish, eight ish, uh, uh, onward for like twenty years. And what was that? Was that like pretty normal? Like just like regular? Like you watch MTV and no, go there to was the mall? No, 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 no. <laughs> it was very different. Than like go to get Burger King. No, first of all, up until like ninety. Three or four, there was like one TV channel, uh, oh, and it's a state-run TV show. Yeah, yeah, state, state. Every Israel used to be a super socialist country, uh, so everything was centralized. You know, healthcare, education, uh, TV, radio, uh, uh, for good or for bad as well. Uh, and uh, so, until I would say late eighties, uh, mid nineties. It was still like Middle East vibe, uh, very, uh, yeah, nobody knew shit about the world. So, so it's very like religious based. No, no, not religious. No, no. No. No, Israel is not a religious country. I've never been there. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> the grand major- majority uh, are n- definitely non-religious, but uh, yeah, there's other fucked up things about Israel, of course, you know, it's uh, quite a... Pretty nationalist kind of, you know, but that's, I mean, you grow up in that environment. It's hard to. So it's totally normal. Yeah, for them. I mean, I mean, I, I, I had the advantage of being an outsider from the beginning, so it all looked crazy, you know. So you were like the weird American kid or something. Yeah. For the first few years, at least. I mean, I, refu- I refused to study Hebrew for a few years, so I was just walking around not understanding shit. <laughs> <laughs> but even though, you, so you couldn't talk to your dad. But no, my dad, he's fluent in English. It's just uh, somehow it developed that we just talked Hebrew as adults. I don't know. Keep it, keep the dream alive. I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> uh, he, does he live in Israel now? Yeah, he, yeah. he lives in Haifa. He's still, he's still very so uh, into it. Oh, so, so let's get away from the... Let, so you're, as a child, you know, what, what, what happens? You're like taking piano lessons or... Uh, you were like uh, doing archery or, or what? Archery, yeah, mainly like shooting archery. Shooting guns or something, <laughs> I don't know, throwing grenades. I don't know what they do. Well, I mean, I didn't uh, I didn't participate in like Boy Scouts or any of that shit, so I did not shoot guns or, or throw grenades or uh, <laughs> wear uniforms. Do they like throw grenades in the b- Boy Scouts? There? No, no, okay. only when you get in the Army okay. you do that. But I, 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 I shot, I mean, I was in the Army later for like 11 months, so yeah. I, sh- I shot guns. <laughs> just not not at people i mean i did have to aim i fu- the first week i was in the army i aimed my m16 at a car full of palestinian smugglers uh, for like 10 minutes shakingly Jeez. And yeah and they're like laughing their ass off the the, pal- the people in the car or yeah, yeah, the yeah 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 <laughs> the, the, the smugglers they're like laughing because they know i'm not going to shoot and they know i mean yeah, and they see this eighteen-year-old kid with a uh, uniform way longer than it should be, yeah, yeah. <laughs> shaking, holding an M sixteen, and uh, yeah, but that seems even more dangerous than someone that want that wants to shoot you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, anyway, that was my, my <laughs> army career. <laughs> no, but I mean, but as, as a child, you must have had some, you know, some things that pushed you to to who you are today. You yeah, know? I mean, uh, I was uh, yeah, classic outsider. Uh, uh, so so no friends uh, no real friends I talked to the uh, like I hung out with other people that spoke English yeah. in my class 
uh, no real friends, uh, you know, obsessed with uh, pop music. That's all I cared about. One of those Walkman. But so what was your access point to music? Was it uh, through the radio? or? Yeah, radio. And th was there record stores also? Or there was one uh, cassette record store. Uh, I'm talking about like when I was 10. So this is like yeah, yeah, 85. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, so, so you got like Michael Jackson bootlegs. They had a lot of cassettes, and uh, yeah, I would. That's the only kind of place I would go to. No, no bootlegs. It was uh, official releases. Official, official releases. Imports. Yeah, and uh, I got into the music just because it was like in English, and I didn't want to hear Hebrew. I hated Israeli pop, I, so I was really. I got obsessed with like the British charts uh, in the mid '80s. Uh, less so the U.S. charts for some reason, but. So I was really obsessed with like Duran Duran, Pet Shop Boy, all 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 of the like electro pop that that was new uh, romantics. Um, I don't. Know. I mean, they, they call it different stuff every year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I did like uh, what do they call it? Like, yeah, fuck. What <laughs> like what? Are they later their comeback was like. I'm only human. Uh, born to make mistakes. Born to make uh, mistakes. I can't think of that one. That was like an 88. Span Spandau Ballet. No, that, no, that's not Spandau uh -huh. Ballet. That's a new, fuck, that's a great band, actually. And that, uh, they had the big hit. <laughs> human League. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> anyway. So I was into all that stuff. Uh, I, was, I don't even remember that being a human league song. League song. I'm only human. That was after Philip Oki left the band, or no, 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 no. That was their comeback in the late '80s. With, that was like produced by Giorgio Moroder or something. That, no, that was '87 actually. Okay, so. That was '87. I'm sorry. No, no Moroder. Whatever. We both like human league is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but even that album, yeah. uh, which was kind of shit at the time, I think uh, it was kind of like. Uh, That's a big one. Yeah, it was it was the good. The Top Gun soundtrack, I think they might have been on there too. The Top Ah, uh, but you know who's on the top, you know, uh, Ber Berlin. Yes, who you know their career before that? Yeah. Yeah, oh, okay, okay. It's what like is yeah, that the sex. I, I'm uh yeah, 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 yeah. that's like one of my favorite uh, disco kind of They're good too. So so you were a new waver. Did you have like a, a dyed black hair? No, but okay, so I wasn't <laughs> like this is when I'm 10. I'm like Okay. So when I was 10, I I I went with the whole culture club, like a boy George thing. So I, I I literally so I wore suspenders uh, filled with uh, covered with the uh, pins. I had this long like uh, rat tail but on the front and it was bleached because I covered it in uh in lemon, you know, that's what the surfers did. Uh, yeah. yeah. And on th and then, and I was wearing these fucking suspenders, which looked really obnoxious. And what, just like aqua converse or something? Maybe yellow? Uh, no, no, no yellow. I just had like uh, all stars. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course. Uh, and then later, this was before I discovered dark music. I wasn't into dark shit then. I was well just at, well at ten. You're you're not very deep. Exactly, anymore. exactly. But then uh, I guess around uh, twelve, it was like uh, the Cure kind of came into, uh, mm. and then Bauhaus and shit like that. So yeah, I was a bit uh, gothy in my later when I got when my balls dropped and I became a bit angry <laughs> <laughs> after your bar, bar mitz bar, my bar mitzvah. mitzvah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Around that time when I got a synthesizer, something yeah. happened. You got a synthesizer for your bar mitzvah. Uh, well, uh, I, I don't know. I wouldn't call it a synthesizer. It's more like a workstation, like the, a Yamaha a motif. No, I, yeah. <laughs> dude, I'm older <laughs> than you. Uh, it was like a Yamaha PSR 60. I think it was, uh, it has like a, you could record like drums separately, a bass line separately, and chords separately. And then I would record, uh, you know, when you put it half in, you could record like l one side. Yeah, one side. So I'd use do vocals. And I remember I had this song, this kind of this song, uh, "Life in Arabia." It was about like <laughs> religious suppression. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, I had a lonely. Uh, is that a lonely is childhood. that on is that on SoundCloud? Uh, no, I wish it was because when I left. Uh, when I left Israel, I I'd left. I just kind of left everything. I didn't, and I had the, my my big. I had a bag full of my cassettes yeah. from my whole like younger years of, of uh, tape recordings and later four track recordings, and my dad just threw it in the garbage. He didn't keep your ephemera. 
No, no, no. I think he was a bit. Uh, he wanted uh, you to move on. No, he just uh, he wasn't into it. Yeah, he's not. A, he wasn't into me leaving him responsible for anything. Yeah, yeah well, he's understandable. Yeah, you know. Oh well, um, it would have been hard to transfer, anyways. You know. Mm. It would have been fun. Not that hard. Yeah, it would have been fun. I would love to. I mean, maybe you could. This, um, my biggest hit from back then. This is from <laughs> when I was thirteen. This was my. This was fucking huge. I uh, I was into like hip hop a little, like you know, okay. whole, like Run DMC <laughs> hip hop. Okay. Uh, the eighties, and I I recorded this beep, and then I, a friend of mine at this age thirteen, I already had some some buddies, and a friend of mine had this like uh, suction comp that cup that you could put on one side of the phone and then you could record the person talking pretty <laughs> clearly okay so i had uh, my grandmother she rest in peace uh she was uh, kind of crazy like for real crazy <laughs> she was like holocaust crazy but kind of mean too like very mean so i i had this conversation i recorded this conversation with her and, she, and pff, like i i kind of made her say uh really funny things not that i say grandma can you please see it? no it's not that kind of relationship i got her mad on me got got her mad at me on purpose so she would say funny shit and i recorded it well like and then go I, clean your room or no it was way worse with bet with swear words but she was yelling at polish you. kind of polish words Kurva. just mean no that's just, that's just mean like mean shit i, I don't even want to get into it just <laughs> like pure kind of mean to her, trying to hurt you for real not like yeah. anyway but it sounded funny so i chopped that up and i made this rap song and i used her uh snippets of vocals on that and yeah my friends uh i really uh, amused my friends maybe one of them has a copy no nobody has a copy but uh, well maybe i don't know but uh yeah it was uh, amusing yeah that was one of my first uh, that was my most satisfying fa- what was did you have out of all was, out was of all the music I ever released that was the most satisfying one. But what what was so were you you were Jordan GCZ then or or uh no actually that that one little little J No no <laughs> it's worse cuz uh JJ Master C <laughs> JJ Master C Yes and the title of the song I think the title of the song was JJ Master C motherfucker <laughs> Wow so if anybody sees a tape or here's a tape that, that has something that could be like this, then just uh, send us a message. No, it was funny because it was like there was the verse, which was uh, like uh, my grandma's shit. And then and then the wait, verse. Wait, what's the other thing? There's verse. chorus. Uh, the cor- wait, uh, Bridge. So no, the chorus is the what repeats itself. The verse, right? Verse. No, the chorus. OK, repeats itself. so the chorus was like my grandmother's shit. And then the verses were me rapping about J.J. Master C, and there was like a... How uh, hard you were. Y- uh, no, no, but S- just, distor- just... Distorted guitar and stuff. There like. was a distorted guitar Ooh. as well. Like, uh, but the Run DMC, dude. Sounds dope. Yeah, it was dope <laughs> as fuck. So but actually, so the drum prob- the drum machine in the Yamaha was probably pretty okay. J.J. Master C. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's way better than Jordan GCZ. I know, I know. <laughs> I would get so many more gigs these days if I was JJ Master C. Yeah, you wouldn't be sitting here right now. <laughs> no, dude, I'm sitting here because I do have a gig. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, all right. So um, that ended your hip hop career. Uh, your grandma found out, and and you were done. No, she, she never she found out. Uh, you didn't play yeah. her the track. No, <laughs> we didn't have that kind of relationship. You like she could like walk around and listen to it on her Walkman. Yeah. <laughs> no. All right. So. Um, so but then I then I got into like better music around age thirteen, fourteen. But what was better music like Dinosaur Junior? Mm, probably that was more like fifteen, sixteen. Uh, more like stuff that I overheard. Uh, either like stuff I heard on the chart and I got deeper into. Uh, I guess like Cure, which yeah. probably like I heard De- a Depeche single. Mode and yeah, order. exactly. And yeah, Depeche Mode, New Order. Uh, and then uh, at the same like time, uh, I got into, I was really into, I don't remember what year this was, but what's her name? Uh, Susie and the Banshees. No, the bald singer that. Sinead ne- O'Connor. Yeah, her first album. I was really into that. Yeah. Uh, M- Mandinka. Right? And there was a song like Jerusalem there. Ooh. Do you know that album? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a pretty. But was it like okay. Jump in the River? 
that stuff? Is it that one? Uh, I don't know. It's her first album. I don't remember. Then uh, I just She's remember the the hit was Mandinka, and that's how I got into it. But then her other songs. I never. I don't remember what the backing music was like. Was da-na-na, it? just guitar, na-na, regular guitar, da-na, Irish? Da-na-na. No, no, no. It's a bit edgier the production. Yeah. It's not like a regular rock production. I don't remember the music to it. I have to check it out again. Yeah, we should YouTube it later. Yeah. Uh, and I, uh, so I got into that, Don't and then I got into... But also, at the same time, I was into lame shit, of course. I was really into, like, the police. and I like the police. And, and uh, even Sting's first uh, solo album I like. That's like a... Set Them Free. You love yeah, somebody. yeah. I, I don't know why I like that, but I like that. I always liked the police, and I, I still like the police, but I don't... Sting... No, Sting is horrible. Himself. He's a monster, but... I don't know if he's a monster, but he just... Uh, not morally. I mean, uh, musically, <laughs> I mean, I can't stand his voice and stuff. But but it's not that I'm like, you know, I wasn't edgy. Like, I mean, I, I, looked, I, like, I looked like a freak. You know what? But you know I, what? I just found out the other... This uh, is a side. This doesn't have to do with anything. But I, I'm, someone, please confirm, but I'm pretty sure... This is a new thing I learned is that Stuart Copeland, yeah. father, f- his father was Aaron Copeland, the guy who did like Rodeo, like the classical composer guy. Is that really? wrong? We'd have to look that up. I'm pretty sure I heard that. Was the he British? Thing, and it completely shocked. I think he was Am- American or no, British. No, but Stuart Copeland is British. I can't remember. There's like some weird connection. Is that? I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. But, but I'm pretty uh, sure that I could be completely wrong. But uh, but I think that that was like a new fact that I learned the other day. Aaron Copeland wasn't the American. I thought so too. Yeah. But I think he had so he has he's like an international child. He like okay. a child like you, just you like know? me. Yeah, he I'm an international passports. man of mystery. Yeah. Maybe he's Australian or something. You know, I don't know. I could be wrong. Sorry to to, to derail you, but that was a. But Stuart Copeland, he's done great stuff since actually. Yeah. All the and sound and, and, soundtrack. And it makes stuff. sense that he's this, you know, he's this like a percussionist, like a real, not just a drummer, but yeah, a yeah, 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 true musician uh, studied. Uh, I think I'm I'm pretty sure that's right because I, I I just found out the other day and it would, would s- surprise me. I, I, someone can tell me I'm stupid on the internet or I can edit okay. this part out part out or whatever, but um, so that's you're you're now you're about fifteen. Living in Haifa or Thir- yeah, yeah, I'm living in Haifa. Uh, yeah, around age thirteen, I started getting friends more. I guess uh, more like after uh, your, with the rap music, you really bonded. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that was my own thing. Uh, let me think. What, no, I started hanging out. You know, like I, I was, uh, I didn't, I, I, I didn't fit in, and uh, uh, you know, wh- after grade school, uh, all the kids from my grade school went to a, to one high school. I went to another high school. Okay. So even the few kind of familiar kind of buddies I had, I totally had to start from scratch. Uh, and then I found a couple friends and uh, started like hanging out, not going home really, and just hanging out, uh, loitering basically for a few years, uh, picking up cigarette butts and smoking them. Uh, it was a uh, kind of not fun, yeah. And going going to movies sometimes, like at the at the like uh, Cinematheque, which is like so what, old movies. By now, this is nineteen ninety, eighty nine, ninety eighty nine. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's kind of just when uh, I haven't discovered drugs or alcohol yet. But thing, the music was kind of shifting. Like we were like, no, was I was already deep in music uh, at that point. Bauhaus more uh, kind of got started getting into skinny puppy and disgusting like industrial yeah. shit cabaret S- voltaire and uh, that's a little later uh, but i started going to like uh, stupid metal like metal any any concert that came to haifa i would go which is like uh, a lot of like death dead, metal dead horse or something uh, or no, napalm death yeah. uh, like th- i saw good stuff uh, like creator stuff that I, I i wasn't really listening at home but you know any chance to go to a live kind of yeah to get into fights, you know, to, to yeah, underage beers and yeah. What's the uh, and so uh, the and co- there was a lot of goths at the club where the live shows were, and I think that that kind of also. Yeah, is it what's the what's the culture like there with the uh, drinking and smoking? Is it you know because in, in Europe it's it's a little more open, like you know you can be pretty young and and drink, but Israel seems people drink less in israel yeah uh, israel is way more of a kind of uh cigarettes. smoking weed and cigarettes because yeah. it's just so fucking hot yeah and i think genetically jews aren't really good with alcohol <laughs> you'll find less jewish alcoholics i have no way i mean I my stomach can't i mean so and the heat it's the heat so i mean uh 
I mean, everybody, you know, all the kids drank on weekends and shit like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, no, but, mean, but it's like they're like a, they're not like a, a sh- doing keg stands or anything. It's no, not, like not at like all. There's none of that. None of this. None of you that. You know, because like the American thing is more like, okay, we can't drink. So when we do, we just, you know, do do it as much as we possibly can. No, in in Europe, they're a little slower with it. In Europe, everything's, you know, they just drink all the time, like since age f- 14. And I guess and that like Russia is sort of like that, which I guess is Europe too. But I, I mean, it, I don't know what it's like in other parts yeah, of the people world. People don't, people, I mean, teenagers all drink on the weekends, but it wasn't, it's not like. Because, uh, I mean, that's, w- 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 I guess my cr- thinking is that, you know, uh, they had this big thing in the UK around that same time where, you know, everybody was getting ecstasy and they started getting into, you know, acid house and then all the raving things. No, did, that, did that, that didn't make no, it. No, no. Okay. That's the thing about Israel. Israel uh, uh, was a trance. It's a trance uh, but country. When did that come in? Later? Or <sighs> I mean... Whenever uh, trance started, like 1993 or something. Exactly. From the beginning, because traditionally Israelis, uh, you know, they go to the army. Okay. Uh, at the time, uh, late 80s, early 90s, I would say... Everybody went to the army. I mean, uh, there was less people that uh, tried to avoid it. And and what? So you go to the army when for you're for three years. When if you're, you're male, 17? 18. 18, eighteen until you're twenty one. Until you're twenty one, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, now it's very different, I think. But back then, it was like you know, if you didn't go to the army, you were w- a social and pariah. And what about women? They yeah, two years, I think. So at the same, the eighteen to twenty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or Everybody, f- your your life ends at age eighteen. So. When you get out of the army, age 20 or 21, uh, what many Israelis do is either go to India or South America. They go to India, stay there a year, uh, take a ton of acid, and <laughs> thus uh, go a trance developed Okay. from that. Or others, you know, go to South America, get fucked up on coke for three years. But uh, but in the 90s, it was all about India. Okay. Every fucking single dude that finished the army went to india and suddenly became a hippie did you go no because <laughs> no that was like i fucking hated that shit that was like i hated trance that was like uh, no, but so, so the antithesis of what and so i and i also didn't do the army i mean i left the army after 11 months so you you know you had your like high school that's like mainstream experience like, and you were pretty much just going to see whatever band came to play yeah and i, I was in a band with my friends and high school was good for me what kind of music were you you and your friends doing yeah i so mean i was into different music than my friends in the band were into i was already into good stuff uh, relatively you know son- so, so sonic you youth and like uh yeah cabaret voltaire and I started listening to a lot of free jazz. So I was the annoying, pres- you know, pretentious kind of kid that knew too much for his age about uh, and not understanding the music I was listening to. But I was can. I got into can, butthole surfers. There was this radio show, one radio show in Israel on the army radio sh- once a week at uh, 10 o'clock at night. This legendary uh, DJ called Michal Niv. And she basically educated me on all the kraut rock, uh, alternative rock in the early 90s, uh, good, like, decent hip-hop. Yeah, see, there were, that was a weird time in the 90s. There was, a, like, a big revival on Can and Noi and all this stuff. She introduced yeah. my whole generation in Israel. All the people I later met in Tel Aviv m- around my same age, they all learned about the music from this one radio DJ who sadly committed suicide, like, 10 years Jeez. ago. Yeah, yeah, but so she, Michal Niv, she really a uh, huge influence on the Israeli alternative scene in the 90s. I mean, I, I doubt, th- in general, there was a huge, uh, there was a big kind of, everywhere, but in Israel too, like all these, suddenly there was like young bands playing, uh, influence from these Manchester bands. Yeah, influence like s- stereo, the Stereo Lab generation kind of, sort of. Uh, in Israel, it was more like uh, either influenced by the fall Okay. A bit earlier, or later from like Stone Roses, really. No, I mean, I'm not saying the, the the thing they were influenced from, but the bands that were similar. That was th- during the early '90s. Like that was the touring bands at that time. Ah, okay. Nah, but no? the thing is, they they all sucked in Israel. All the bands, including <laughs> my band, was the w- like we we were the worst. What was band. what was the name of your band? Yeah, Index. Index, like the magazine. Uh, <laughs> I, I think they opened a dictionary or something. They, I mean, I joined in. Ap- they started when they were 15. Oh. 
and they got rid of uh and what did you play the, the keyboard and back backing vocals yeah. and what keyboard were you playing the roads my bar mitzvah one oh still on the yeah, on the, yeah, on the yeah. yamaha the yamaha psr something <laughs> yeah <laughs> horrible sounds D- and, and do you still have that thing no I don't know. Oh, no, no. I gave it to, uh, I think, like a a neighbor's child or something. Oh, that's cool. And so (laughs) so you did this for a while and uh, nothing really came of it other than just being. No, but I mean, at the same time I was doing I mean, so I had a certain taste in more like alternative uh, music and the other band members liked more uh, shit music, more like uh, like. Yeah, m- mainstream rock more. Uh, so that at that time it was like what, like Soundgarden or something, or before that. Yeah, it was before. Like it was before. Jane's Addiction or no, Jesus, before. Jesus Jones. Uh, yeah, I wish. No, no, <laughs> they were like uh, they loved like you know, like Led Zeppelin or no. no, but also like kind of the new bands like you. Ma- but they were like uh, in spiral ca- carpets. La- you know, later into the, uh, that whole kind of Brit pop sound in ninety two. L- like weird. Yeah, but anyway, so uh, our band was horrible. We were just kind of n- new wavy, poppy, uh, so that didn't singing help in Hebrew. Uh, didn't help you at all. No, but we didn't have. We had some good gigs. We played at the like you know famous uh, Lollapalooza in the Israeli famous uh, rock club Roxanne. That was the height of our career. So is that on your resume? Yeah, of course. No, <laughs> first thing. <laughs> no, and we were on the radio and shit a few times. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, uh, I hated them. We all hated the music uh, that we oh, played. Oh, you're gonna band. say I hated them? Uh, yeah, I hated. I mean, the drummer. I always fucking hated the drummer. He hated me too. Oh, d- did you fight? Uh, once. Yeah. <laughs> once. Uh, it was. It was around Hanukkah, which is this uh, holiday where you eat donuts. <laughs> you know about that one? I've you, heard, you, I've heard you light the menorah. Yeah. I, uh, so anyway, uh, I didn't know about the donuts. My buddy, the guitar player, he came to the studio rec- recording in the studio. He came with a bag full of donuts. He gave each of one of us a donut. The fucking drummer took my donut, threw it on the ground. <sighs> I'll never forgive him. <laughs> anyway, he's a yuppie piece of shit. Anyway, nowadays, oh, poor guy. I love yeah, it. but what I'm saying is that I didn't listen to the same music my band. Uh, mates listen to it and at the same time that I was in the band I had a four track and I was making my weird shit at home and not playing it to anybody uh, and those are g- also gone yeah my father threw them Danny away. yes Danny threw them out mm-hmm. Daniel yep alright so this you know then you turn 18 and you gotta go to uh, the j- army jail or whatever. no the, the army. army oh yeah yeah, yeah. I, similar I, I, I've heard this story before but yeah. I, I, can you give us a, some of it or, or, or uh, the, 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 it, it's not a um, I know a few people that had to were forced to go to the military. Mm-hmm. I know other people that weren't. So I mean, it's a pretty good story. Yeah, the thing is that when <laughs> you when you when I don't know what you're referring to story wise, but you know when you grow up in Israel, there's no doubt. I mean, you grow up with no doubt that you're going to the army. So it's not really. Uh, <sighs> it's not terrifying because oh. uh, you know everybody has to do that shit. You don't know even any. You know, I, I mean, at the time, I didn't know one person that did not. Well, well the story that I'm referring to is the one uh, how you got out. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, no, but I think there's still interesting things got about yourself kicked out or, or. Yeah, yeah, but that's yeah. yeah. I'm more interested how, like, if we're talking about music, I'll just mention how I even discovered the, the techno stuff because that's related to the first day in my army. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, oh, the, the fir- this is the first day of the army is techno. Yeah, first day of the army is when I uh, first. Uh, are, are there, so here's another question though: Are there there's different uh, like uh, uh, segments of the Israeli military? There's, there's like Air Force and Navy. Or, or yeah, yeah, it? of course. And are you predetermined to go to one of them, or you have to pick one? No, you don't pick shit except your nose. I mean, you go to the thing, and they're like, "You can't swim, so you're in the army." Or no, everybody goes to the army. So they send you to this base. You you meet with some fucking asshole that uh, uh, determines where you, where your whole next three years are going to be. H- how do they do that? Uh, that you meet with the, you do an aptitude test. So, and is this physical or, or no? Or it's uh, written, uh, but uh, they also have your medical records, of course. Now, because I have asthma, and back then I had really hardcore asthma, so immediately I was safe from uh, going to a fighting unit. So that already, you know, took a big load off. So that means, you know, I'll never have to fucking shoot at anybody. 
except for on your first day. Yeah, but I didn't. I, I wasn't going to shoot. But yeah. So so true. so so they decide they're going to send you to the army for. Uh, so I so I was sent to the easiest basic training, which is uh, basically six weeks uh, of basic training. You sleep in a tent in the desert, surrounded by uh, other people that either have like uh, health issues or like criminals types. You know that they. That later, you know, they don't want to give them a weapon because they're criminals. <laughs> but it was only six weeks. I mean, Gal, Juju, my, uh, from Juju and Jordash, he was fucking six months in basic training living in a tent like a fucking... Yeah. Anyway. But he probably, he probably finished his... Yeah, he did finish the three years. Finish his tent. Does he, yeah, get, does he get like a better tax rate or something? Like, or do you have better standing in society? Uh, I mean, I, can't, I couldn't be a lawyer or a doctor if I stayed in Israel example like you're not allowed i'm not allowed no yeah but anyway my 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 little story about the music and the thing so first day i'm in the army the uh, and on the bus to the basic training i'm i'm wearing uh i, I looked annoying i had like uh, nose rings and earrings and uh, like platinum colored hair and like a leather right. jacket with like a dead kennedy's thing on it very you know very annoying 17, 18 year old looking kid. Anyway, I was sitting next to this dude. I'm listening, uh, I don't know, listening uh, my Walkman to something. And next to me, there's this other depressed looking dude listening to his shit. He looked super depressed. And uh, the whole the rest of the bus were having a party. I mean, they were loving it, these fucking jackasses. You know, excited to get, to get in the army. And we're the only two depressed dudes there. And so we started talking. And he asked me what I'm listening to. I was listening to like Ornette Coleman or some shit from yeah. Free Jazz, which he hated. And he was listening to to Model 500. Yeah. And I was like, "What? What's that?" And I was telling him like, "Yeah, I I like industrial music, electronic industrial music. Uh, you know, Coil, Skinny Puppy, and I like jazz." And then he said, "Dude." You never heard about techno? I mean, this is exactly, you love this. This is like jazz and industrial together, man. You have to listen. Juan Atkins. And uh, yeah, that was, and and then that was it. What was what was this guy's name? Yeah, Yoav B. He later became, uh, he, he oh, released some music. I think I did a remix for him. It's very possible. He released on uh, Delson Records later. He was the best DJ in Israel for many years uh, in the mid-90s. He was like a resident at the only clubs that brought decent DJs. So you were in, you were in the army with him. Yeah, and then we made music together for many years and uh lived together for many years. And anyway, he was talented as fuck. He's like he's like uh, legit. He could have been like a musical genius if he pursued, but I think his uh, personal issues uh prevented it. But so 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 you were on the bus and you heard Model 500 and, and 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 then I was like, yeah, this is exactly what I like. It it's like uh, I love jazz and there's the, all those like uh, Model minor 7 jazz chords just like Yeah. like Herbie Hancock there and at the same time there's like all these fucking amazing synths and like rough like rough beats just like I like from the industrial and it's funky but it's still jazzy it's and uh yeah then I got real then I got like just totally obsessed with yeah. techno and yeah basically so that's I mean so it was worth going to the army for so this that this is probably what, uh, this 1993 or something like that yeah exactly 93 so it was a good time to get into techno like and it was very hard in Israel to score any of this stuff. So it also added to the mystique. And, mm -hmm. you know, you had to go to Tel Aviv to a certain st a shop, look at their, like, uh, at the at their order lists and, like, uh, tell them, you know, it was an ordeal to get records. Yeah. And, and so you were in the military for a while, and somehow you got out of the military a little bit early. Yeah, well, two and a half years early. And uh, just... Just I, he I heard this pretty good story, but you got out of it. We don't have to go through it. Um, yeah, it's just uh, you know you go to the shrink and uh, yeah. And then uh, what what happened? So you finished? Did you stay in Israel, or you're like I'm out of here? No, this I was like I was uh, 19 only. Yeah. So uh, I moved in as a. I mean, before that, I already was living in Tel Aviv uh, because my. The 11 months I was in the army, I uh, my job was in Tel Aviv. So I became a roommate of my sister with another few uh, roommates right in the center of Tel Aviv. 
And uh, was your sister like a music person too, or no, not at all. She was really into the army back then. Oh, geez. Yeah, yeah. Now, now her she changed a lot. She's an art therapist and uh, like researcher, but. Uh, she was in the army back then, or she just finished the army. She's okay. older than me. She had a job like uh, at the film. She was like uh, in, uh, importing foreign films or something. I don't know. But anyway, uh, I was already living in Tel Aviv then at 19 when I finished the army. And uh, yeah, I was there. I, I, I went, I signed up to university to kind of get my parents off my back. And And what? You went to school for what? Mm, cinema for the first semester. <laughs> cinema. Yeah. I like <laughs> movies. Yeah, yeah, we all do. Yeah, so I went <laughs> to cinema and uh, for one semester. And then what happened? Yeah, uh, it, it was full of, like, pretentious yeah, fucking 23-year-old assholes. Pretty uh, awful. Yeah, really the worst people. And then, uh, and I realized also you can't really make a movie alone. Like you need to, co -op, like, work with other people, uh, sound guys and... And that did not appeal to me at all. I really wanted, uh, I was a control freak back then too, and which is why I was like already making music with my four track and I didn't want to be in any bands. So I quit the cinema shit. And you need money to be in cinema. You need a camera. And yeah, I mean, what, what I found, uh, the people that I met that were in film, they finally graduated then, and then they spend the next uh, three years saying they're looking for investors. And yeah, then they I never mean, get them and then, then they're, 35 yeah i didn't even think about those things back then i just didn't want to have to a ask people for favors to borrow their gear yeah, yeah times are different now kids if they, if they want to yeah just i mean with their cell phone jesus yeah you can make a better quality movie with your iphone but i did end up doing some music for for other people's uh, student movies which was a uh, pretty and good and experience. you were still on the yamaha Ah uh, no no! By then, Still I like already it. I already had like a four track, uh, I had a bass guitar, I had a drum kit I found outside in my room that I mic'd up weird, and I had a DX11. Sweet. Now by then, I was already playing in like other some synthesizer stuff, some like free jazz. Yes, exactly. With uh, my good friend and yeah, this. Uh, so that's just like jazz that has really fast and really slow parts. No, no, it was more no. I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not a good I'm not like a classically trained. So uh, you're you're not doing like standards or stuff like no, that. No, I am. I am, but not uh I am with friends with Gal. That's how I met Juju actually. He's yeah. a guitar player. So we just would uh kind of drink a lot and then uh just try to play standards. He's more traditionally trained and I so just he, so he would teach you the song and you would No, I had the notes. Okay. I'm not a smart guy. I can teach myself shit. But <laughs> but uh basically uh uh where were we? Yeah, I was making music alone. Like the jazz thing was just a hobby kind of with yeah. my with my friend. Yeah. And so so you met Gal that way, yeah, through and jazz. Th and then you were on you were in Juju and Jordash and you started playing festivals. Yeah. <laughs> that was 15 years after. <laughs> yeah. So this this is probably what 1995 now or so in your yeah 1995 I started sending demos out I cruising guess. around the Tel Aviv scene. Did you have a? Do you there did was no scene. Did you man. have? To, did you have like a regular person job to like pay the bills or you were? Just I worked in the cinema. My sister take, hooked me up taking tickets. Yeah, I was a usher for a few years. And was it like an art cinema? No, like a regular. No one. regular cinema, but yeah, yeah, it was a regular cinema. I, I think I saw. Yeah, I mean, I saw Shawshank Redemption probably 200 times. <laughs> but I was drinking at the time, so it was different. So you just... <laughs> okay. I had a flask with me the whole time. I was uh, I was sad. I was sad. So not much has changed. I don't drink. <laughs> oh, well, you're still sad. No, I'm yeah. not. <laughs> uh -huh. All right. So so, so young young Jordan Chomansky living in, in a... Tel Aviv, mm -hmm. taking tickets at the theater with a Sta flask. And starting to go to parties because uh, there started to be some underground techno parties, really fast, hard techno. And, and what? who were the artists that you remember that were coming to play, or, or was it local? Locals? A lot of locals, yeah, a uh, lot of locals. So what's that? What's the Israeli guy that plays really fast that's, like, kind of good, uh, sort of? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, hallucinogen? Never heard is of that, is that, is that too Never. It wasn't around. I don't know. Uh, for us, for well, uh, I was going to, th you know, all there was, there was like trance, outdoor trance, uh, nature parties. That was very, very common. Uh, 
and that did not interest me at all. And they didn't uh, have like a chill out room or in era. I don't know. Not really. I don't know. I only went to one, and it was just too much for yeah, me. Yeah, I'm not into it either. No, it was really horrible music, and the people. I mean, the people are already all on acid are always nice and on ecstasy, so can't say the people weren't nice. But it's this kind of. It's not me. It's like Grateful Dead vibe. Yeah, like it's more about the drugs. Yeah, I was more into the clubs and the and it like not clubs. It was more like a warehouse uh, kind of uh, techno parties. Uh, there was some really good parties in Jerusalem as well uh, that you had to like drive to. And but you don't you don't remember a, a really good one that happened in that time, or they were just all kind of this. Uh, Nobody good came to when you're like, not like the moment you heard Model 500 or anything. No, no. I mean, uh, I mean, I don't remember what you year didn't. it was, but yeah, these were really underground. I mean, they didn't have budgets to book. Yeah, yeah. Though, like my buddy Yoav, he would DJ at them and yeah, yeah. other local DJs. There was never a guest. But later, a couple of years later, it started uh, when my buddy Yoav started uh, getting residency in clubs in Tel Aviv. He used to bring the American DJs. I don't know. I remember was it like Josh Wink or something. No, no, he had good. He had really better. Like I remember Roy Davis Jr. coming in the kind of mid late nineties, or like uh, well, uh, Derek May was fine. Like it was, it was good. It was a good uh, education. The thing is that it was very sporadic. So like, uh, yeah, like three times a year. Or something. Yeah, something like that. And uh, two of the times it was canceled because there was some like bomb, like bus bombed up in Tel Aviv, and the DJ canceled or something like that. All right. So, um, but it was good. I mean, the mid to late '90s in Tel Aviv, I went to very good parties. Probably most of it is just uh, nostalgia, and it wasn't really good parties. But I remember some really killer parties in the late mid to late '90s. And 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 you're going to this? You, did you have like a group of friends that you? Yeah, yeah, with? yeah. And uh, were they part of your music stuff, or or were they just buddies? No, I mean I, a lot like. They no, they no, they just for like yeah, I like you the from the cinema. No, no, not from the cinema. More from the party scene. I okay. mean, it was like yeah, and and like you're like twenty. Now at this point, probably twenty, twenty four. And then and so you're s you start sending out demos. What what labels were you sending your demos out to? Yeah, well, let's see. Uh, you every like all the things I like. That was just what's ridiculous. So like. I mean, I sent to like what I sent to guidance. I sent, like I sent to everybody. I sent to no, like you don't remember like there was like the one you wanted to be on. Uh, no, because I was very fortunate that the f that uh, one of the first uh, demos I sent out was I sent to like uh, Larry Hurd, uh, not intangible, uh, 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 alleviated, alleviated yeah. and I sent to like Track Mode, Brett Dancer's label, and okay. I sent to uh, Moods and Grooves. And I sent to Terrence Parker, Intangible. And I was lucky enough to get really uh, positive feedback from uh, from Larry Hurd. And, and and so you're sending these demos, you're sending these are CD, like CDs, CDs, CDRs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, unfortunately, I kind of fucked up. And uh, I put out a, a track uh, on uh, Terrence Parker's uh, label. Is it just a solo one, or yeah, yeah, and that was JJ no, Master this is, C. No, this was jo I called myself Jordash at that point. Jordash. That, was like, that was just a nickname that friends of mine called me until like the after the jeans. Yes, and that's what you wore all the time, or all the time. I didn't, I, I didn't have gigs or anything. So the, the no, no, no. I'm saying you. Oh uh, yeah, you my friends, they fucking called me Jordash. Yeah. No, but you did. Did you have a pair of the pants? Never, <laughs> never. I, I was a Levi's boy. Oh okay, I'm just, yeah. just checking. Yeah. Uh, so you sent the demo to to, to Terry yeah, and you put it out on a compilation, and then a CD compilation or, or record. It was a CD compilation called like it was in like it eventually I think was released in ninety nine or two thousand. Okay. Uh, and then and so you're like oh, I and I, I, I was a stoner at the time and like but I was th a this bit is of a this to just to for for our younger viewers this time ninety nine you could still sell CDs 
and maybe make a living. Yeah, I didn't make money. No, but I'm saying you. So, so maybe it you was thought, just you the cuss. It was the end of it. You thought maybe, oh, maybe I'm gonna put out a CD and get a few bucks. No, that no. it wasn't about that. It was all about ego. This and that's what kind and of like, paralyzed me for a decade. I'm on an American label now. I'm cool. It wasn't about even about that. Like the second Larry Heard wrote me back and said he loved my music, you were. That was enough for me to sleep well for 10 years and do nothing, basically. <laughs> to not send anything else, not to, like, pursue anything, just to, like, do drugs and fucking waste my time. So you took drug, my drugs time. for 10 years? Uh, I mean, drugs. You know, I wasn't <laughs> a junkie. But I just, uh, I didn't really push myself for, a, for many years, I think, because You're I felt like, oh, my ego is satisfied now. I can make music, put it in the, never play it to anybody, and I'm happy because I know that my biggest musical hero approved of me, and <laughs> I think it really... Uh, have you run into him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you talk to him about it, or...? Uh, I, I had an awkward conversation uh, with him about it in Mexico two years ago. What? He didn't re really remember the whole thing, so but... He's just like, yeah, 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 yeah. No, but we, like, he's always very nice. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but it was, it was very uh, embarrassing, the whole thing, yeah. But I, mean, I think it's good you brought it up because I'm just it, it gives another perspective, you know. This thing that was like super important to you was just kind of like no, but and it was never about the money uh, back. Yeah, like I never thought I didn't know anybody that made a living from music. Yeah, up until I moved to Europe, mm -hmm. which was when I was thirty. So I didn't know I didn't have any plan to make music. Like I thought maybe one day I would like teach music or something so you, you you spent this you know this 10, year, ten years your, your 20s yeah in tel aviv no. between tel aviv and haifa depending working on working at the movie theater and no or being registered to, or moving to haifa and being registered to the university and not finishing it ever so kind of a student student life sort of mm, no because i wouldn't go to class it was more like really i was like obsessed with music all day all night but not doing never anything. doing anything with it and what what made you make the jump yeah i mean i don't know i just uh, i you're like i'm out of here for five years i was sitting on i could have finished my ba five years in a row i had only one or two credits left for five years and i never did i never finished it and i think and but the ba was for music no, no, oh. just history and philosophy. Oh, okay. So you could have been a lawyer or something. No. Oh, you didn't. You lawyer. didn't finish the military. No, you I could have been an academic. That was the thought that uh, maybe I would like become an academic. What kind of history did you study? Uh, it was just general. It was BA. So, uh, but I focused on uh, medieval history for some reason. Oh, weird. Yeah, and I tied everything somehow to the Holocaust. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I. And did you finish? No, I never finished. I. I that's a thing that. I remember the last, I mean, I was laying in bed. I had a test that day. I could have finished my BA, and I, I would have passed. Yeah. And I said, I was, like, looking at my ashtray. with a, There's a joint in the ashtray. Like, nah, nah. And I just didn't go to the test. I never finished my BA. And, uh, <laughs> and I think, uh, and then I left Israel. Wow. Yes. And so you moved to Amsterdam? Yep. And, uh. What happened there? The, the, is there a, are there a lot of Israelis or whatever the hell you are moving there? Mm, I mean, back in the back in the eighties, that was like the hip kind of Berlin kind of town for Israelis. But then it became too expensive for just regular. Well, people. in the nineties, it became in the late nineties, I think. Well, I mean, once it switched to euro, actually, two thousand and one, okay. it, uh, it became expensive. But it used to be like growing up in Israel, like everybody talked about Amsterdam, Amsterdam. That's like that's the place where all the music yeah. people went to back then. And I had a friend that uh, lived here. So I visited him when I was 18. And then I kind of said, ah, yeah, that's fucking dope one day. Well, wait, nice lived when you say lived here, you mean Amsterdam? Yeah, he lived. Okay. Oh, yeah. Not sorry. Not right now I'm in Brooklyn. Yeah, so I okay. forgot. Yeah. In Amsterdam. OK. Uh, so, yeah. And I just. Uh, I when I uh, I thought I would just go to Amsterdam for six months. Well, that's a lie. <laughs> uh, I told everybody I'm going to Amsterdam for six months, and then you're gonna come back and finish. And no, school. I didn't talk about the school, oh. but uh, just I'm talking about my friends. Okay. Uh, and then I'll come back. And uh, but I just uh, yeah, I just I left my apartment. I I just 
lent I gave my friends like hey, hold on to my uh, turntable hold hold on to my record collection and I just never came back and uh then I taught myself to design websites because I needed to make a living and ah uh, oh, no and then no and then Gal was here and then we started Juju and Jordash then we needed a website so I taught myself how to do websites and then I started making a living by designing websites for sex workers <laughs> mainly <laughs> and that's how i made a living until the gigs came in <laughs> yeah so you could build me a website not anymore i mean i know the technology of uh 2002 i mean i anything beyond like basic html i'm lost <laughs> i'm gonna move this a little bit here yeah do squ squarespace i heard that's what all the kids are doing today Squarespace, yeah, um, you could probably figure that out. I think. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm fooling around over here. Um, <laughs> I, I uh, and to get to get a job building websites for sex workers in uh, what this is ninety nine two thousand. No, this is two thousand two. Two thousand, yes, yeah, not two thousand three, four. I don't know. You went to three, like four. a temp agency or no, or no, no. This okay. M I I met uh, my girlfriend, and she was w she's a, a journalist. Worker. No, she's a journalist. She was she was working at a at a like all English magazine that existed in Amsterdam at the time, mm -hmm. Amsterdam Weekly, and she could hook me up with a free ad in the classified and she's the one that said ah oh, look you know how you built a cool website for your music stuff why don't you like because i was like desperate for money and i was like working at a pizzeria for like three euros an hour uh under the table and she, she's like why don't you offer your like website services so i did and, <laughs> and i remember and I, it's stunning websites for low prices so, I mean, I, I basically, my clients were the bottom of the barrel, like people that didn't have money. So it was a lot of yoga teachers, sex workers, S&M, because uh, they were stunning websites for low budget. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And yeah. how, uh, how much w did you have, like a flat rate for, th for a website? Kind of. Like, like, I, uh, like if it was like 500 bucks for and I'll the put, works. Put you something up. For something, yeah, but I worked on it hard because I had to teach myself while I was doing it. But too, so. would you like a uh, set it up to where they could update it, or you would m remain the gatekeeper? No, I, I, back then, it was before there was like back end system, so yeah. I had to. So yeah, for example, this one S and M woman and her uh, boyfriend, uh, I had to update all the time, and <laughs> that sucked ass. Because what does that mean? You gotta watch their footage. No, it w videos. I I didn't know how to do videos. Luckily, they that's that's why I stopped working on that website because they wanted to monetize videos. And I said, I, have, I can't. I'm not gonna learn how to do that. But I had to You'd fucking. Be rich I right had. Now. I know. I had to <laughs> airbrush like her ass, like pimples off her ass and shit like that. Yeah, and that was like the, that's the best of it. I'm not telling you even every worst week, shit. every week. Yeah, but this, this is the weird thing that they they were like they had this kind of weird kind of relationship with me too i mean when the dude hired me we met in a public library i didn't know yeah. what i was getting into he didn't i didn't know it was like going to be an snm site so we sit in this public library say hi i'm jordan uh yeah and he says oh I, i'm i'm whatever his name is i won't say it on uh then he took out of his backpack these weirdo kind of 70s magazines of snm hardcore snm like german SM. do you like this and i said um nah, not not really so I'm hiring you. So basically he hired me because I, I wasn't a freak. Uh, and he and his uh, white girlfriend, uh, they despise their clientele. That's the funny thing. They're like, she's like a mistress mm -hmm. and she despises her clientele. And the only reason they hired me is because I'm not a, not a degenerate pervert, as they put it. <laughs> wow. So anyway, the weird thing about them is that their whole way of life is like S and M. So he kept tipping me, which is a weird thing. He used to like stick a hundred euro bills in my pocket when I would leave after I would update their thing. And that was creepy as fuck. And another thing that was creepy as fuck that the first time I, I after that library kind of initial introduction, I went to their dungeon because I had a meeting with them. So they had a fucking dungeon in the red light district where they conducted their business. And that's where I had to like, you know, do the website meeting. 
So I'm sitting there alone with him in this fucking basement in the red light district. The first thing he does is he takes out this fucking Rambo knife, puts it on the table. So, I mean, it was a weird thing. He was always, he was the most generous client I ever had, but there was always this underlying threat of you, like. Have you run into them and just like walking around? Uh, no, but like uh, once a year I get a text from him asking if I can update his website and I text him back, I'm no longer in the business. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Maybe you should just meet up just to... I didn't enjoy his company. He's, he w- he, he's a short, very, very muscular, greased back hair kind of dude. Not your type. Not my type. <laughs> no. I mean, we got along fine and, you know, we joke around and shit, but there's something weird about uh, the whole interaction with them. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> well then, so, so, so you're up. Uh, your web design career uh, so <laughs> sounds like it was okay. It wasn't so bad, but, uh, but I mean, I was just thrilled to be able to pay pay my rent. But you moved on from that. Yeah, the gig started coming in, and then you know. So, so Juju and Jordash was going at this time. Yeah, we put out our first record, two thousand four, on uh, Reggie Doke's Psycho- Psychostasia label in Detroit. Yeah. Oh, that's w- yeah. What? You sent him a demo or how did Yeah, he was like one of the first. He's like, uh, we sent like 10, maybe five or 10 demos of our first uh, Juju Jordash sessions and he responded uh, first. And huh. we were thrilled because we loved, like it was a, didn't have many releases. I had like six releases at that point. Yeah. But super special at the time. Uh, you know, we were real nerds, uh, Detroit nerds. And like yeah, yeah. we loved Psycho that's Yeah, but that's a kind of an obscure, even for Detroit, it's pretty obscure. Label. Yeah, but we were already living in Amsterdam, so okay. we had access to rush hour and, you know, yeah. there was internet by then. Yeah. But even still, it's still a pretty obscure label. Like, I think m- most Americans barely know that. Yeah, but Americans are kind of dumb when it comes to techno. <laughs> Uh, you know, white Americans <laughs> outside of Detroit don't really didn't really know much about Detroit as much as I don't think your it, Europeans. I don't think people in Detroit know much about Detroit. No, either. probably not. But I mean, European nerds only know m- way more about that only shit. Only the people that make it. Yeah, yeah. Um, geez. So, so that so you put your so now that you're on an American label, then European labels will release your music too, or something. No, uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, that's not. I mean, we weren't. We didn't have a plan. We were just like thrilled that like w- one of our favorite ra- labels wanted to put out our a record of ours. And so, so you sent him the. We dem- still didn't know anybody that made a living from this so shit. So you s- you sent him the demo, and then he's like, "Yeah, sure." And then they send you a test pressing to approve. Mm. Do you remember any of that part, or? I yeah, I think I have a test pressing. He sent you a test pressing, and you're, and you're yeah, Reggie Dokes is super nice, casual guy. You know, send him an email back. Yes, sounds good. Press it up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Here's the artwork. And then they no, we didn't send them art. We didn't know anything about anything. And, and then then they send you like ten copies or or rush hour buys. No, we got. I think we got like ten copies or five copies directly from him. Uh, I don't think rush hour distributed back. Th- did rush hour even exist? Yeah, they existed, they of course, but they. I don't. I don't. They weren't the distribution. It yeah, was, it was a Detroit distribution. Mm. I doubt that clone, rush hour had a copy. Probably got some copies. Or Possible. I mean, it was it was around Psychostasia. Yeah, it must have been. Um, and then, uh, so did that get you some, st- you started playing live gigs or you were playing some gigs before no, that? No, no gigs yet. No gigs. But Zero we were, gigs. But we were like, Gal got a sweet gig at a studio in Amsterdam. Okay. To, you know, just be kind of a... So he moved to Amsterdam also? Yeah, yeah. The same time you did? A little before. Okay. Yeah. He, he's five years younger than me. So he kind of finished the army. He was one year in Tel Aviv and then said, ah. I want to get the fuck out of here, and, and he moved to Amsterdam. And he went to like the sound engineering class, SAE. and so that that probably helped your decision a little bit. Or no, I decided before he. L- I'm the one that suggested he move to Amsterdam, oh, and, <laughs> and I found him the course as well. It just took me longer to collect enough money to do the move, because he he finished the army, so he got a bunch of money from the army, so he could do it. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, I so yeah, so uh, after that uh, we were just in this. So he got a sweet gig at a like. a you know, pretty professional studio, uh, just recording band like metal bands and all sorts of crap, just, you know, studio gig. But the thing is that the studio owner was a nice guy and he let us anytime, a- every night we would go there and do free night sessions in a professional studio. And that's where we, for like years, that's where you got your 10,000 hours. 
yeah definitely and we had access to gear yeah, I, I never saw before do you remember the name of the studio or the yeah, yeah fort it doesn't exist anymore it was called fortress fortress studios in amsterdam yeah, yeah. and what happened to the guy the do you, do you know uh, uh, you know, it didn't work out as a commercial studio, of course, because that's exactly the years that people started doing everything at home. Yeah. Uh, he he went on to... He's a good musician himself, but he still has a little studio at home. I'm not really in touch with him much. He mm -hmm. went on to, like, online marketing, maybe, or... So he just tried something else. You didn't yeah, stay friends yeah. with him? No, not really, no. Uh, friendly. He came to a gig of ours last year. Oh, that's in cool. Amsterdam, yeah, I'm still like Facebook friends with him, and uh, once every two years. He I doesn't see him. post like right wing stuff or anything. No, 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 oh, no. that's good. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Got to watch out for those. So, so, so now you're you're you are Juju and Jordash. Yeah. And uh, this is with Gal. Mm -hmm. What's his last name again? Anair. Anair, and uh, you're so now you're working at nights in this studio that he works at and yeah and, and that's like 20 minute walk from our apartment re recording a lot of music uh, yeah a lot. Or, or just playing yeah like everything we we recorded a lot of musicians as well because uh that he had some really good mics so we we brought in like a great sax player a trumpet player and, and what other d are there people that you're still in touch with now or people that other people might know that you met then and start uh associating with or or Everybody, everybody that I'm still like from the first Psychostasia record. I mean, uh, we got to know uh, Scott Ferguson. I don't know if you know him. He and Reggie, they remixed one of the tracks on our first 12. He now lives in London, but he's a great producer. Uh, I mean, that. I'm, I don't know. I know. I, I don't know. I met a lot of people in Detroit before that, too, because my first solo release out there on the Terrence Parker thing too was in Detroit. So yeah. I visited Detroit in 2001 and I met, met a bunch of people then as well. Uh, but you know how it is. You put yeah, out yeah. a record and you get emails from people and then you stay friends with them forever. I mean, yeah. back then internet was a bit nicer forums, you know, yeah. I met a lot of people through the deep house page. If you remember that yeah, yeah, forum, yeah. uh, yeah, I really, I actually. Well, wh wh who are you on the Deep House page? Jordash. George. But I wasn't that active. Super just a lurker. I just, yeah, I was a bit, no, not only I was, I, I participated in one of their like uh, edit competitions. Oh, yeah. We got second place. Oh, man. What did you edit? Uh, Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> what song? Uh, Family Man. Oh, geez. Yeah. Wow. It was cool, man, because usually the edits there were kind of boring, classic. Not boring. I mean, there's some fucking great you edits. You know there, what to expect. Yeah, like a classic disco edit. Yeah, or yeah. yeah. so w it was kind of a. I like I like participating in that shit because it was like anonymous. Because you're so competitive. I am. <laughs> I really am. <laughs> <laughs> it comes out. Um, yeah. So so, uh, but but what what I was talking about in the studio is that you yeah. know I thought that maybe since you were in Amsterdam, there you were part with you know there was maybe people part of the rush hour scene or no that came way later. They those fuck like I mean I remember I I I dropped them demos. Uh, I, I didn't get an email back ever. They, <laughs> but they, they kind of started being nicer once we released in Detroit. Yeah, <laughs> but no, I wasn't that part of that crew at all. I was not part of that crew. At all that's like really pretty. That's more like uh, from 2010 forward. I got to know. Yeah, you need a validation from outside before you're you're accepted within your own. Even community. if you're an outsider, I mean. Yeah, it's I mean, weird, huh? I mean, I played uh, like Tel Aviv, for example. When I was living there, I played like a total of like three gigs. Yeah. You know. Everybody complains about you know not getting gigs when they're local. Yeah. So it's the same story yeah, every city. So, um, so y you developed it. You know, this is this is kind of what the 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 salad days. I guess you didn't you weren't really caring about money so much. No, I didn't. Just in it for the music and staying up late i was trying to get better yeah. working on tracks um but it, you're mostly just playing with like when you're when you're have your fingers on the keyboard you're playing with gal mostly or, or were there other people coming in or uh, it was just you and him mostly yeah yeah yeah. mostly him just you know. figuring out what gear you liked and how to use it all and hook it all up and get Ga gal is all has always been more of the technical guy yeah uh, and I've been, m I'm like a more of a keyboard player. He's a guitar player, so it's less natural for him, the keyboard. Mm -hmm. And he's more analytically minded. Yeah. So uh, it was, 
Yeah, a lot of both, like getting to know the gear technically and, uh, yeah. And uh, what wh- what what brought you to the next level? Because, I mean, at this point, I would say that you're a professional musician. Uh, and maybe at that point, there was something, you know, where was just releasing a record doesn't necessarily make you a professional musician. No, you need to make a living from it. Yeah, when you decide that that's what you're going to do and nothing else, uh, uh, maybe you become a professional then. You have no choice. Yeah, I guess. Do you, know, do you remember a moment when that happened, or, or was there like a, mm. a tough question? Tough question, but I do remember very specifically one of the first gigs that we had uh, outside of the Netherlands. We were booked by Fabric. Yeah. And it paid, it paid like, I don't know, like 700 euros each of us. Yeah. And I was like, holy fuck. Because back then I was living off of 700 a month. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, holy fuck, just give me two of these a month. And I'm like, fucking, I'll buy a synthesizer every month. And that's 2011, 12? No, eight, nine. Oh, okay. Still early. Yeah. Uh, and that's when maybe it was like, uh, fuck, we should like maybe try to get more gigs. Like, I mean, yeah. Cause I mean, uh, I remember the first time I met you, we played for Christina. Records. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody showed up. Yeah. Yeah. And there was nobody there because they didn't want to pay. And then they decided to let people in for free and everybody yeah, came in. Yeah. I think maybe that was even your idea to let everybody in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, they're all sitting in the bar. Why don't we just let them in? Yeah. Like, yeah. Th- rather than cry all night. Um, but that what that was 2000 i have no idea 9 yeah something like that and s- by at that point that was for me i uh, that's when stuff started to happen you know you started releasing like more records maybe you know a n- you'd have a new release or okay i have a good okay I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk shit too much but i'll talk a little bit of shit so anyway so 2004 we put out this uh, psychostasia yeah. 12 inch uh, the same year i guess or uh, there's this pretty damn fucking cool compilation called Detroit Beatdown. Okay. On third year. Okay. Do you know do you know that compilation? No. I know I've heard the name, but I, I'm not I'm not a it's I'm a not really a techno guy. Yeah, yeah, but that's not really techno. That's how Detroit House. That's like but uh that's Theo Parish stuff. Anyway, no, I was never that compilation. Uh, fucking love that compilation. So we got in touch with uh, the third year, or he got in touch with us actually. And offered us an album deal. Uh, this was like probably 2005 or six, and he said, "Yeah, I'll pay you six thousand uh, pounds. Yeah, ten track album, distribution in Japan, da da da, distrib- And and this beat down, you know, it sold a lot. I mean, I, I mean, that shit going yeah. well. Uh, so we thought, okay, we're fucking set. Yeah." So the next two years, we perfected this album for him. That's all we did. We said no to a lot of labels that asked for music. Turned out a lot of opportunities because, you know, fucking third year. I mean, this compilation was like my favorite compilation at the time. Is that is that the, is it blue? I don't remember. On the cover? Likely. I, I, I don't really remember uh, how it I'm looks. Not, I don't. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. It's a really good compilation. Uh, Malik Aliston had an amazing track on there. No, I don't know it. Yeah, we're really into the Detroit thing. So okay. anyway, uh, we're done with the thing. Uh, the album, we sat on it for uh, for many years. It's supposed to be released. Suddenly we get an email. Hey, guys, uh, our Japanese distribution just crashed. Uh, there's no album. There's no 6,000 pounds. And, you know, I already spent that money. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that money was already, like, scheduled for the next, like, rent for six months. Mm-hmm. Like, I did not save money at all. So that kind of destroyed us. That, like, really was a wrench in our plan. of. Uh, oh, wh- what happened to the album? That's the first album we put on the Comanto. Okay. So uh, I guess... Uh, a couple months later, we met these kids. They booked us to play this beach party. They didn't know we lived in the Netherlands. They just knew our record from Psychostasia. And they booked us to play this beach party. And then they found out that we uh, live in the Netherlands. And then they came to hang out at the studio. Told them the whole story about third year. Played them. And then they said, oh, shit. 
we're gonna start a label and put that out. And that was that that was Deck Metal's first release. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Juju and Jordash, and what was the name of that album? I again? think Juju and Jordash. Just that. Yeah. And uh, so. Um, in the meantime, we put out a digital album on Rope Dope, but that that doesn't count. That's more jazzy, and yeah. only digital, yeah. And so, y- that begins your relationship with with the uh, Deck Metal, which at this point was just some dudes throwing a party. Kids, yeah, like a d- like hundred people in the party. Like yeah, just enthusiastic kids, really enthusiastic, real music nerd. Deck Metal happens, and then uh, you put out this album, um, and then uh, was that. Nothing dramatic happened at any point ever. This because this is two thousand nine. Nine. Yeah. And so, but you know that's kind of a. a we were already having good gigs before that. Yeah. And at that point, uh, they were a new obscure label. So if the reason we did it with them because they were so enthusiastic and and, and they're exciting, lo- they're locals. It's also exactly nice. we really wanted that. We didn't want any of more of these email like. Yeah, if you want your money, long distance, and, and we were just burned road. by this British dude. Yeah, well, you probably took too long. No, our record was ready. He was just oh, postponing it. Yeah, no, that's too bad. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I was very angry. I didn't like. I met him uh, a few years later at Free Rotation. I didn't shake his hand. Like ten years later, now I'm probably cool with him. But I was, yeah, dirty dog. I hold grudges. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll remember that. Yeah, I remember I was on the phone using the f bomb like you motherfucker, and I'm never like I'm not like that, but yeah, he m- he made you snap. Yeah, he really. But what did. is he? Is that label still around? Or, or I think so. I mean, he's a nice. guy. Everybody tells me he's a nice guy. He just uh, made a mistake. He shouldn't have promised shit. That's all. Mm, well, at least he didn't disappear. You know, he told. No, 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 no. He probably. Uh, who knows? Um, I'm sure he's a nice guy. <laughs> all right. So, and now your career's over. My career's totally. <laughs> Well, no, nah, it's well, still going. It's still going well. From what you say, it just it's just been boring ever since 2010. No, you didn't ask me anything anything since 2010. Well, you said nothing major happened. Ah, n- no. What I meant is that there were, there was never one point that suddenly Juju and Jordash was success. You as you know you know you know very well that it was a slow build. A slow build, and it's still a slow build. Yeah, still building. Exactly. So I mean, uh, but then if you don't have a really fast ri- rise, then you don't have very far to fall. You that's know? what they say, but I don't know if that's true. I mean, I wouldn't mind a little a little bump <laughs> now, <laughs> now here and again, a little bump. Yeah, uh, you're about. I mean, we could use it. You're about due for one, I guess. One, okay. You got to get yeah, out. Yeah, Jesus, like fuck. When will we ever like get uh, a fucking a hit? N- a Nissan commercial or something. Yeah, fuck. We even have publishers. Uh, Jesus, you got to get us something. You got to get a, a new uh, 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 a placement uh, agent or whatever. I don't know what they. We mean. have. It's a publisher. Yeah. yeah, we have that shit. Yeah, but I think those are not. But I people around us are making some money from that, man. Huh? May I wonder. Yeah. Really? From what from what I've heard, the people, the ones that I know that are are getting some success with that, they said that the the advice they gave me was that they watched the movies that they liked the music, mm-hmm. and they just took the names off the credits and and found out ways to contact these people and and offered them the music. You know, that's just that extra step that somebody took along the way. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I am a big believer in the personal touch. So I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't. I'm not going to do it though. There's no way in the world. But isn't there like a, a a pretty there's a pretty big film industry, but it's Hilversum. I guess that's different than Amsterdam. But there's not a big. Fi- how many people in the world speak Dutch? I don't know. Yeah, not I don't many. But that's like what everybody says. Like the Dutch Hollywood Hilversum. Or what? I never heard that in my Hil- life. Are you, are you confused with Bollywood? No, <laughs> Hilly Hillywood <laughs> I yeah. think is what they call it. <laughs> Netherworld. Yeah. Um. But th- I, I, you would think that there would be well. Well, maybe it's not a, as 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 reputable as being uh, having your you know scoring a Scorsese movie or something, but you know you could have your music placed in some. You well, know, I would love it. I have no problem with whatever. that. Whatever. Like even now, you get you can have your money in an Instagram video and 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 you get money. I'll take money any way you give it to me. <laughs> so we need to find you a uh, somebody out there that that wants to uh, represent nah. you and place nah. your music. No, uh, well, there is whoever's rep- doing it no, for I you now. Is I want a patron. Good. I want a patron of the arts. That's the best situation. You're I want a, like a you're Medici. Dream- I want You're dreaming. I know. I know. <laughs> so well, you're gonna go live in their castle for a little while and wouldn't that and be glorious? Learn how to fence. Wouldn't that be? No, <laughs> I'll just be in the studio. I'll get like a little gruel each day, uh, a little weed each day. I'll I'll give them like an album a month. Uh, they'll give me some money. 
And what what would they what, what why would they do that for you? Cuz they have these uh, fancy parties and they want to impress their fucking hipster rich friends and they have exclusive music from But you think these kind of people would want to hear your music or you would have to cater to them? You have to get a harpsichord or something. Probably I would need to <laughs> yeah, I would need to <laughs> get a harpsichord. <laughs> But uh, but that would be nice. Yeah. I mean, anyway, we're everybody are pretty cool. You know. I mean, I'd rather do that, to, uh, like a personal patron than like but uh, what, but, but be a patron of Nike or something. But aren't rich people usually pretty cheap? They could just use like a Spotify. Or no. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm talking about like if the culture changed. Like if we go back to like, like the Renaissance kind of. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we can talk about that some more if you want. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, yeah, uh, this, this, uh, the, uh, s- with some of the past guests, we, I've talked about how this, uh, you know, this s- constant touring, is, is, uh, it's hard, you know. And you're, you're also playing live most of the time. Your, your focus mm, is yeah. a little different now, but generally, for the past ten or so years, you've been touring as Juju and Jordash, which means carrying a keyboard or two, and some other box yeah. stuff, and then trying to get a writer and then you get to the club and then you kind of see what works yeah and you do a really long sound check yes and then you maybe have a falafel yeah and then we yeah and then you play for two hours or an hour hour, yeah improvise each time that's been going on for two years and now you know what gal lives in tel aviv now Mm -hmm. so uh the logistics are a little bit different and he also has a, a family now yeah and so you've been doing more solo stuff as mm-hmm. Jordan G C Z as I would say, but you would say Z because you're Canadian. I guess, yeah. No, it sounds better. G C Z G C Z. I just don't ever say Z. It's no, it's a bad name. I'm aware of it, but that's my Yahoo email address, and I just and my middle name wait, is wait, the the e is Z E D, right? No, it's Jordan G for my middle name, which is yeah. Jeffrey, which is Geoffrey, basically. <laughs> uh, Chemansky, CZ, yeah, at Yahoo.com. But what I'm saying is that we don't say Z, we say Z. Instead I know of Z. that we, we. I'm American too. I know we say Z. It just, it's hard to say GCZ. 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 Maybe it is cooler, actually. GCZ. Yeah, so I've been doing more of that lately. Sorry. <laughs> get, a little, get a little tangent there. Yeah. But um, so, so now you're doing that. Uh, it's pretty much the same thing, just one person yeah. instead of two mm-hmm. um but generally when you play live uh is one person doing more more of one thing like the rhythm or, or the melody or bass line or you split it up or, or how does that work out when you do solo does there a change yeah so you have to handle the drums more or yeah, juju and jordash basically at this stage it's uh gal juju he does all the drums and uh, uh occasionally a bass line and i do the synths and the, the rest yeah so he's rhythm and your yeah. melody. Yeah. And uh, now, so now you just play beatless music or? No, <laughs> <laughs> motherfucker. You just have like a 4-4. Four, four no, kick. it's more, actually it's interesting. I'm, you know, I've only done uh, a handful of uh, live solo. Yeah, drums are hard. No, that's the thing. I like, I, I mean, I like, uh, I mean, I love what Gal does on the drums. You know, he's really yeah. become a real master at it, but. I mean, I also love uh, repetitive kind of uh, grooves that don't change much. Yeah. And that's what's been happening more with my uh, solo live shows. And yeah. that and that's kind of cool because that's, uh, you know, instead of going uh, more noodly, I'm actually going more tight than Juju and Jordash with my solo stuff because of the... Re- the repetitiveness. Of yeah, the yeah. That f- that yeah, I'm, I'm kind of y- pleased with that. Y- you don't ever set the, you know, you can set you know play eight bars and then have a fill you don't ever try that kind of stuff i, I press the fill button you myself. just press it live yeah yeah i don't want it automatic yeah it's gonna kind of, that would be a lot of counting yes you have to count to like 100 and t- whatever i don't have time for that yeah 168 or 128 whatever. yeah <laughs> sounds difficult so so that that's seems like it's going well and uh you also have a, a label now called um off minor recordings off minor and uh yeah, and you released on that label like five years ago, so it's not that I have that label now. I've been having that. Well, I'm just bringing it, it as well as doing this solo. Yes. You've been running a label for the past five years called Off Minor. Yes. And uh, which releases not only your own stuff, but a few other people. Yeah. Um, how's that going? Is it, I mean, I talked with some other, some of my other guests do it, and we've noticed that record sales are down a little bit. Big time. And uh, digital, digital seems to kind of hold it together a little bit. 
it helps not for me no not for me my my digital sales like my band camp is like dead but as do you fuck have, do you have a digital distributor yeah yeah but i only started that like a year ago yeah so. you should that should it should no it's great i mean right? i mean i mean i don't know last quarter i had te- i made 10 bucks i but mean d- but does that m- make you wanna um are you gonna keep doing the label Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is no. I mean, I'm doing the. Uh, my, I have a record coming out next week on uh, Off Minor, Darling and Lexi. Okay. I don't know if I sent that to you. No, I think I saw the. I don't. I didn't. I haven't heard it yet. Yeah. So I mean, instead of releasing like three records a year, maybe I'll release one or two a year, and make them super special, and make sure I do uh, proper promotion. And this one, and and in this case, I got a P and D deal for the first time. And and but did you? Does this? Uh, are you you're more selective with the tracks now or you're just not or no i'm just less in a rush okay just wait till yeah i mean i i have i have other two other things in the pipe three other things in the pipeline and unfortunately the artists just have to be patient yeah yeah it's not it's it's, it's slow a little bit right now well there's a lot going on there's people release too much music now and i don't want to be part of that yeah so there's like this darling and lexi it's a super special record so uh and and are they they're friends of yours or how did that yeah, come about? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a thing. I have a studio in the basement in this basement of this hotel, and there's several studios there, and uh, one of them is uh, Darling Anton. His name's Anton. His artist name is Darling. He shares it with the other guy, Tom Rauch, uh, named Tracy. Anyway, so he. Uh, we hang out a lot uh, in the smoking in the room. Smoking room, yeah. So uh, there's a kind of good uh, chemistry, good vibe going down there, and uh, everybody hears other people's music and you know exchanges ideas and stuff. And uh, one day, I think he was down there with his four-year-old daughter and uh, just fucking around on the keyboards and stuff. And and I don't remember exactly how it happened, but you know, I was like, yeah, shit, this sounds better than. This sounds better than any of this fucking music that people make down here. And he just made uh, like a mini album out of it. Uh, she plays all the keyboards. Uh, and h- how old? Is it? It's his daughter, you said? Four-year-old daughter. And uh, like he just like set, it, set up like arpeggiators and she played the keys. Or he just quantized what she played or didn't quantize even. And then he did the beats. It's pretty wild. Yeah, but it kind of sounds weird, uh, weirdly the kind of Drexian, huh. yeah, free form. Yeah, no. but 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 still, the way he edited it, it makes it sound uh, very natural and yeah, it's a, it's a cool project. I mean, it sounds pretentious, but it's just oh good I'm music, you know. I would I'd be curious to hear it, you know, yeah, e- yeah. whether or not I like it or not. Who cares? No, you'll you'll probably like it. Yeah. It's what uh, then say it again, darling. Darling and Lexi. Darling and Lexi on off minor recordings coming. Coming in oh, a few weeks. By yeah. the time this is out, it'll probably yeah, be yeah, out yeah. and a huge hit and everybody knows it by now. Yeah, yeah. But um uh y- what else? So you're in let's we're gonna finish it up. We've been going for a while now, but um uh you're here in New York, you got a couple gigs, you're gonna go play in Detroit, play at n- the new club here. Um mm-hmm. same old same you're at up to the same old stuff, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, and but ga- and gal, but y- this is not solo. You're with gals. Yeah, this this is a Juju and Jordash thing. Uh, Detroit, it's also Magic Mountain High, and also uh, Magic Mountain High plus Jonah Sharp, which is the Mulholland Free Clinic. Jeez, you know Jonah Sharp's music? No, Space Time Continuum. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you know. I don't know anymore. I only know that these two dollar records that I've strung. Yeah, well, by. you can f- like Astroworks early '90s. Oh. Wow, those are starting to turn up now, so maybe yeah. maybe I'll find them. I think you will. Jo- what's the name of his artist thing? Uh, Space Time Continuum. Sounds familiar. No, maybe he's maybe super I do have something. Legendary dude. Uh-huh. Anyway, anyway, so yeah, this is a new venue tonight in New York. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, Public uh, Records. It's, uh, it looks amazing. There's like fancy speakers and like it's an audiophile place. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So um, look out for Jordan. Chimans- GCZ, yeah. Chemansky. George G- George Jeffrey. Yeah, I should have made my artist named Jordan Chemansky, right? It's it Jeff- rolls off the tongue. Jeffrey Chemansky. Yeah. <laughs> so look out for him uh, uh, around the world, and uh, you can find him on. Uh, do you have like a 
a booking area. We can find your booking yeah, agent yeah. through Octopus. Octopus yeah. And uh, do you have like a website people can go to? or, or that? Mm, no, sorry. You don't have a fancy website anymore? You were a web designer. Yeah, Just no. message him on Instagram or Twitter. Or Twitter, Facebook. yeah. You can find him on Twitter too. He's writing stuff all the time. Yeah, I complain a lot and then I erase it, yeah. But um, uh, thank you very much. Thanks for having Jordan me. Jordan, for coming by. I hope uh, we don't have to edit out too much. And uh, but Don't edit shit. You seem okay with it. Um, I don't care. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. See you next time. Bye-bye. How long was that? Thank <laughs> you.